Um, so our second speaker is uh, James Mang. So James is an NSF Graduate Research Fellow at the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, he is in his third year working with Caroline Morley, exploring the complexities of exoplanet atmospheres. His work focuses on the physical and chemical processes present in the atmospheres of cold brown dwarf and temperate giant planets, especially the effects of clouds. Uh, the title of his talk today is Modeling Water Clouds and Substellar Atmospheres in the Era of JWST. So, James, whenever you're ready, go ahead and share screen and take it away. Perfect. Can you see my screen sure. properly? Yeah, looks great. Awesome. Great. Thank you so much for that introduction, uh, Tiffany. Um, hi, everyone. Yes, yeah, so today I'll be talking about our ongoing modeling efforts for these ultra cool substellar worlds. Um, I'll start by discussing some of the key findings from our microphysically informed water cloud models, uh, but more importantly, talking about where these are going to be used for a JWC program. Um, I would also like to thank my collaborators, uh, Peter Gao and Ty Robinson, for the help with this work. Uh, so, first, now let's set the scene. So, here I'm showing a figure I'm sure many of you have seen of confirmed exoplanets based on their mass low y axis and uh, period on the x axis. And so they're color coded by the detection method. And I'm also showing Jupiter here for reference. Um, and so JWC is really pushing us into the regime uh, where we can actually study these temperature giant planets, which are also these RV detected Jupiter analogs, um, that these will have similar bulk properties, but most importantly, similar effective temperatures to Jupiter and the gas giants in our own solar system. Um, so now it's really exciting for us to actually characterize these planets that are similar to the gas giants in our own solar system, which is something that we couldn't have done before. So within the regime of RV-detected RV temperate giant planets, um, there are different types of clouds which actually form affecting the spectral features. So what I'm showing here is a diagram based on the mass of these uh, giant planets versus the effective temperature. And you can see as you go from different temperature ranges, you can have like alkali, water, ammonia, and methane clouds can form in the atmospheres of these objects. So the question then is, how can we study the atmospheres of these objects, especially with these volatile clouds and the different atmospheric dynamics that we see uh, in the present the atmospheres of these objects uh, as we continue to analyze and prepare for these JWC observations of them. Um, and we can actually use brown dwarfs for, for this. Uh, brown dwarfs are perfect analogs for us to study. Um, they are much more observable than temperate giant planets since we don't have to worry about complicating uh, systems uh, for stellar radiations or contaminations and such. Um, they share effective temperatures and masses uh, of these giant gas giant planets. And so they will actually have some atmospheric chemistry present in the atmospheres. And so we can use brown dwarfs as a laboratory to test our atmospheric models and then hone in the details of them so that we can actually use them as predictive models for these gas giant exoplanets. If we look at an evolutionary diagram here, uh, it really shows the relationship between gas, uh, gas giant planets and brown dwarfs. So here I'm showing temperature on the y-axis and age on the x-axis here. Uh, we're going from lower mass objects, these planets in the blue, up to higher mass objects like stars here in the red. So stars, of course, are, are large enough so they can fuse, uh, but these other objects, for example, brown dwarfs and planets, uh, will cool over time as they evolve and go through different temperature regimes and spectral classes. And so there's an age mass degeneracy here. Um, so if you follow the black line here, if there's a young 70 million year old object here, it could be a temperate giant exoplanet. But if you have an older field age object here, for example, of a white dwarf in this case, uh, these objects share the exact same effective temperatures and therefore the features of them will actually look very similar in the spectra. Now before JWST, um, here I'm showing some of the ground-based observations of wide dwarfs uh, from Miles et al. 2020. Um, in different colors are the observational spectra and the, in the gray represents the best fit models um, for these specific wide dwarfs. And so we can see that these models can sort of fit the data, but not really well in all cases across, um, across the spectral features here. Now with JST, we can observe wide dwarfs at much higher resolutions. And I'm showing here as, uh, as a selection of data based off of uh, Jackie Faraday's program, um, showing just like the exquisite data JWST is providing us now. Uh, these high resolution observations of these objects really motivates us uh, for these new improved models that we need. Uh, because if we couldn't fit these lower resolution ob objects before with our models, it's gonna be much more difficult for us uh, to really look at these JWST resolutions that we have now of these objects. Um, and so we're also learning a lot from these early observations for the chemistry and physics that haven't been considered in previous models. So what is our science goal? Uh, our goal is to study water clouds and its effect on the observables in the atmospheres of ultra cool brown dwarfs and thus temperate giant planets um, by generating the most physically accurate atmospheric models and then comparing them 
to the observed spectrum um, to see what else we can actually learn from them. So how do we start doing this? Um, so here I'm going to orientate us onto how we think about atmospheres and look at atmospheres. Uh, so what I'm showing here is a pressure temperature profile. Uh, we're going from colder objects with, uh, like for example, here 150 Kelvin uh, up to a, a warmer object or a 400 Kelvin object in this case. Um, so this is the top of the atmosphere here, going to deeper parts of the atmosphere as we go down. Um, and this black dashed line here is the water condensation curve. Now, Eddie said here, is a commonly used parameterized cloud model that has been used to generate clouds in a lot of the substellar models. Um, this model really only considers the vertical mixing of cloud condensate. And in this parameterization, in this case, water clouds form to the left of this condensation curve. Um, so that means that all excess water vapor, in this case, of the saturation vapor pressure condense, and all the cloud formation immediately shuts off to the right of this, um, of this condensation curve. So that means that at this specific layer, where across this condensation curve in this thermal structure, there is no more clouds, it's immediate shut off, and there's a sharp cutoff in the cloud base. And if you think about it, this is actually really unrealistic if you think of clouds in our own atmosphere, for example. Um, we usually picture more of a puffy cloud with like a unique morphology, um, and not all the vapor condenses immediately. Um, but this would require some microphysics that aren't included in any said, um, that considers, for example, particle growth and loss rates and interactions with um, cloud condensation nuclei. Uh, to better understand the vertical transport considered in Eddie's set, I want to quickly show this equation here, which really shows the prescription for the mass balance of cloud formation. Um, on the left here, really, is just uh, talking about the upward uh, mixing of condensate and vapor versus on the right, balancing out the downward transport of the condensate. A couple of key terms here that I want to highlight here, the variables, is KZZ, which is the Eddie diffusion coefficient that you might have heard of, which really talks about how strong your material is being mixed upwards. And then QC here is the amount of condensing material. And then F set here um, is really the most important parameter that we tune the most when we generate clouds. Um, and this really talks about how well can these particles settle downwards due to gravity. Um, so a low F set, for example, a value of one, uh, would generally represent an optically thicker cloud versus a higher F set, for example, 10, uh, represents like an optically thinner cloud. So some of the processes in addition to that vertical mixing and balance that we have that's in Eddie said, are these different microphysical processes like nucleation, coagulation, and condensation. So these aren't considered in Eddie said, but how can we then incorporate these microphysical processes as well as evaluate their impact on the cloud morphology? So we can use KARMA, the, the 1D community aerosol aeration model for atmospheres, uh, which includes these microphysical processes. Um, so you might think, well, if we have the KARMA model, um, that includes these microphysics, why can't we just run the current model instead of using any said model? Um, the reason for this is because the computation expense of running a current model. It takes about 12 hours to run one single karma cloud profile, while well, it takes seconds to run one any said uh, cloud profile. Um, so when we need to iteratively solve for a self-consistent profile for the thermal structure with the cloud included, we can't afford to run multiple karma models within this numerical solver. So what can we do to fix this and include the microphysics? Or is it even important to include the microphysical processes in the effects on the observables? So what we do in this work then is we use current models with the th same thermal structure profiles or the pressure temperature profiles that I showed before as the set models and do a direct comparison of the cloud morphology between the two models. We can then see what are the differences based on the treatment of cloud physics, what's important to include, and what prescriptions we can add into set. So if you have more questions about our workflow methodology, I'd be happy to chat more about it later. I'm also not gonna show all the results we found in this work, but just gonna highlight a couple of our findings. Um, so here, what I'm, diff what I'm showing here is an optical depth profile of a water cloud. And so um, the different colors represent the different eddy set models with different f set uh, numbers. So once again, remember smaller f set means a more optically thicker cloud and the larger f set means optically thinner cloud. And so karma is in the black uh, solid line in this case. So there are three stark differences that you can see immediately to catch the eye. One of it is the differences in the peak optical depths that you see here between the karma models and the Eddy the Eddie set models. Another thing you see here is, for example, the treatment of the cloud, these differences in the actual vertical extent of the cloud that you see here, where the karma model in the black line is more constrained than the more lofted uh, Eddy set models. One other thing I want to highlight here is this cloud-based falloff, where I described previously, there's a sharp cutoff in the Eddy set model because this line here represents the layer where the thermal structure crosses the condensation curve again. 
shutting off all cloud formation, while the current one considers the, the mixing and the microphysics that occur maybe below uh, the cloud-based cutoff in this case. And so one thing to note here is that all these F-set profiles I'm showing here are constant. What that means is from the top of the atmosphere to the bottom of the atmosphere, um, they stay the same. So F-set of six at the top is the same as F-set at the bottom of the atmosphere. I mentioned that those are constant because what we can use to actually better improve the model is using a variable F-set prescription from Runion 2022. Um, this really helps us match the optical depth profile of the microphysical karma model. So the solid lines, just as previously, are these constant F-set values, uh, F-set eddy set models. And these dashed lines then are the variable F-sets where the um, F-set value at the top of the atmosphere is an F-set of three. And with a negative beta value, for example, in this case, the best fit model of minus 0 0.1, it starts at a three at the top and it grows to a larger F-set value by the time it gets to cloud base. So the impact of this, as you can see here, we can actually have the peak optical depths uh, much more aligned to the karma model, for example, here. The vertical extent is actually um, a lot closer to the karma model in this case. It's not a perfect fit, but it's much better than, for example, in this case, the FSET 3 um, case that you see here that's much more vertically extended. And then finally, we also included a gradual fall off based on uh, our analysis of all the karma models that we ran for many gridded models. And the average fall off in the optical depth of each layer below the cloud deck is by about 4%. And so we've included that in our one best fit model case here in Eddie said. Most importantly, we want to know what is the impact of including these different changes in the observables and whether or not we should even include them or is that important for them to consider in the future. So here I'm showing the brightness temperature profiles for the Eddie said with a constant F said first versus comparing a karma case uh, with the largest difference as you can see here in this three to six mark operation. Now, if you include just the cloud-based fall off that 4% change in their best uh, in, in a uh, constant F said case here, uh, we actually don't see much of improvement in the observables. Um, but if we include, for example, the variable I've said, um, it really matches the karma cloud much better in this case, or the observables that the karma cloud uh, causes in the spectral features. Um, so here you can tell the optical depth value at the cloud base drives the observables in comparison to, for example, like the cloud base fall off. And this variable I've said really improves the fit to observables in comparison to a set model with a constant I've said. We also found that there's a difference in the amount of water condensing into the cloud uh, between two different models. So what I'm showing here is the column mass profiles between a karma model in the solid black line and the eddy set model in a dashed black line. And so remember the eddy set uh, prescription right now is that all water vapor in excess of the saturation vapor pressure condenses into a cloud. Um, so this leads to actually a couple orders of magnitude difference in the amount of cloud materials uh, between the two different models. So we tried two different methods approaches to try and reconcile the differences uh, between the amount of mass uh, that's condensing. The first thing we tried is essentially making it harder for the water clouds to form by using different S cloud var uh, values. What this S cloud really is, is just increasing the supersaturation um, in the atmosphere after the cloud condenses. And so what it essentially does is, as you can see here with a larger S cloud value, it basically moves the condensation curve to the left. But what happens then is in this case, for example, what I'm showing here the column masses for these same three cases for different S cloud values. And then he said, you can see that uh, we can actually better match the column mass um, with the karma model, but because it moves the condensation curve to the left, it also moves the cloud where the cloud is forming in the atmosphere. Uh, since it follows the thermal structure profile, as you can see, it's go further to the left, it goes further up in the atmosphere. And so the cloud base, um, as you can see here, is actually further up than where we ex would typically expect it to be, or where it even matches for the karma model, for example. But it does match the karma cloud column mass a lot better. The second approach that we took to try and actually keep the same cloud base level um, is by mainly removing the amount of cloud that is, uh, that is in each of the models, or in the Eddy set model in this case. So we can force the model to only use 10% and 80% of the original Eddy set cloud mass while it's solving for the thermal structure profile. And so, for example, you can see here in the maroon, um, this produces a column mass profile that has the same cloud base level as the expected eddy set cloud in the original eddy set cloud model in this case. Um, but it still does not perfectly match, uh, for example, the karma column mass. Now, even we have both of these methods that we try to do to reconcile the differences in the amount of uh, column mass, uh, column uh, mass of water clouds is condensing. Uh, once again, we're going to see what the effect of this is on the observables. 
So here I'm showing the spectra for eddy set models uh, with different S cloud values and diffractions of eddy set clouds. Um, the spectra, as you can see here with the Karma model in, in the black here, is that me, um, the spectra doesn't fit the Karma models well in any cases in this three to six micron uh, range here that I'm showing in this inset. Um, so this demonstrates really the emphasis on the optical depth profiles with that variable I've set as the major driving factor again once to match the uh, observables in this case. Um, because all of these cases here are, are using a constant F set uh, because we did this try and disentangle the different contributing factors that would be important to consider from the microphysics between both the variable F set and versus the amount of water that's uh, water vapor that's condensing in this case. So now that we have these findings and lessons learned about the important aspects of the microphysical models with a prescription for future parameterized models, uh, what can we do with these water clouds? Well, if we look back at that evolution models and those tracks that I showed previously, you can notice that these actually don't extend to the cold temperatures where you expect a true Jupiter analog to reside, at, for example, 180 and 80 Kelvin. Now, if you look at the latest evolution models from the Snorin Diamondback models released by Caroline this year for warmer L and T dwarfs that have uh, some clouds included in them, uh, where the cloud-free ones are in the dashed lines and the ones with the hybrid models are in the solid lines here, um, you can actually see that including clouds for these warmer objects, these L dwarfs, um, actually changes the evolution tracks by a couple hundred of Kelvin as the clouds cool the objects a lot faster. Now, one thing to note here is that even these colder objects in these, uh, at these colder temperatures in these evolution tracks are um, using models for cloud-free objects. And so water clouds need to be included for them to provide a more accurate evolution track. And here I'm showing a selection of substellar models. Um, this is by no means an exhaustive list. Um, and what I'm showing here are the different variations of parameter spaces um, that are included in these grids of models, referring that temperature, surface gravity, type of chemistry treatment that they have in the atmosphere, whether they include clouds or hazes or not, uh, the different metallicities that they probe, the CDO ratios, and of course, whether or not they include evolution models. Um, and so one thing you can see there is uh, not, some have evolution models, some don't, some have clouds, uh, some are clear, some have equilibrium ones, they don't have this equilibrium chemistry, for example. And so these models that are needed for these JWC temperature giant planets need to probe down to these colder uh, regimes of temperatures. So I'm introducing here is the next suite of Snora models that I'm currently working on. Um, and this is going to probe down to 75 Kelvin objects, up to 400 Kelvin objects, um, with chemical equilibrium and disequilibrium, with um, different volatile clouds included in these atmospheres, um, with a range of metallicities and C to O ratios. And finally, of course, including the evolution models for these objects, along with the larger range of, of, of objects from the previous suites of Snora models. And so we're going to do this with Picasso. Um, it's first used uh, for generating transit spectra along with thermal emission and for the light spectra, but now it includes the ability to run atmospheric cloud models. Um, it's the exact same code that, used, that I was using to run the pressure temperature profiles that I showed before uh, for the eddy set clouds, but now it's just in Python. Uh, so most importantly is that Picasso's climate model now includes the capability to run uh, atmospheres in chemical disequilibrium, uh, which is important for these cold objects. Um, this was first developed by uh, Shining Mukherjee and has been used to produce these Nora Alpha Alpha models for clear substellar atmospheres. And so I've been working on Picasso to include the cloud parameterization and the lessons that we found from the microphysical work to be integrated with these climate models in both chemical equilibrium and disequilibrium to generate that next suite of Sonora models. So feel free to follow our development uh, on the GitHub page. You can scan this QR code here. As the latest code, it's uh, all open source. And so if you want, you can also pull the latest bugs that I'm running to as well for the different branches. Um, but I also want to, uh, before I end, I also want to uh, highlight an important, exciting object that will be leading the modeling effort for with these cloudy models. Hey, James, you've got object... about five minutes left. So it sounds like, okay. yeah, cool. Um, thanks. Um, and that object that we're really excited about is Wiseway 5.5. Um, and this was first discovered in 2014. And not only is it close at about two parsecs away, it's the coldest known brown dwarf at around 250 Kelvin. Um, it's in that perfect range where it's cold enough for water clouds to form, um, but not warm enough for ammonia clouds, um, but uh, for ammonia clouds to form. Um, and so if you put Wiseway 5.5 on this diagram that I showed previously of these RV detected um, exoplanets, uh, we can see that Wiseway 5.5 fits right in the middle here. 
And so studying Wiser 5.5 can really help us understand and directly look at water clouds uh, on these other objects outside of our own solar system before we use them for these temperature planets. And so here I'm showing some of the initial data from a program led by Annie Skemmer, Brittany Miles, and Caroline uh, for a JBC time series observation of Wise 55. Um, this was completed in December and the team is very excitedly still working through the data reductions and refining that. Um, and so here what I'm showing here quickly is a spectra taken over of all the spectra taken over 11 hours with near spec. Um, this time series observation aims to study the variability of Wise 55, uh, which is expected to be varying by three to 5% and studying water ice cloud features to really distinguish the difference between atmospheric dynamics present in Wiser 5.5 that are causing the variability, or whether or not there are actually water ice cloud spectral suppression features that we actually have, that we need to actually have these better models for to include, to understand and really characterize the differences in the dynamics occurring in the atmosphere of this object. Down here, I'm also showing the percent change as a function of wavelength as you go through time from the top to the bottom here. Um, and great news here, as you can see here through percent change is that YZ55 is variable. Um, what is causing this variability is something that we are still working on that needs further analysis on into before we can actually say something distinctly about it. Um, some things you can think about, for example, here, maybe it's more driven by discipline chemistry and vertical mixing because you see a lot more variability in this case in, like, for example, the CO bands and CO features that you have in the spectra. Um, but we still need more time to actually find and generate the models that we're using um, to really understand whether or not what's the driving factor for these percent changes in variability in YZ55. So stay tuned for further developments uh, as we work on this program. So in conclusion, um, a, for the microphysical water, uh, water cloud work that we've been working on, a vertically variable F set can actually better fit the optical depth profile to microphysical karma models, uh, including that cloud-based falloff is of second order of importance to that variable F set. Uh, Supersaturation pre is present in these karma models, um, significantly reducing the amount of water ice clouds condensing in the atmospheres. Um, and we, I'm working on generating the next suite of new SNORA models uh, for cloudy atmospheres for these cold objects in both chemical and uh, chemical equilibrium and disequilibrium with evolution models that be opened and sent to the community. And of course, uh, our models that I'm working on is could be used for numerous JWC programs, but especially our program for Wise 55. And so um, I just submitted the paper for the microphysically informed water clouds. So keep an eye on that. And you can follow all the development for Picasso as well. And I'll stop here and take any questions. Thank you. All right. Thanks, James, for a great talk. I personally have been wondering about the effects of variable F set and supersaturation on having used these models myself. So I'm glad that someone's finally <laughs> looking into all of that. Yeah running some models. Um, all right, uh, so again, questions, if you have them, uh, please use the hand raise tool or put something in the chat. Um, I do have a question in the meantime, and this is just maybe my um, not keeping up with uh, the brown dwarf literature. So obviously I know that it's important to try and reconcile the two models themselves, but I guess what I'm curious about, has Karma historically done a better job of matching brown dwarf observations with as compared to the Edison models? Is that part of this drive for the comparison? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and Karma has actually, uh, in previous work, has always been used for solar system body works. That's like right. the historical context of Karma um, for, for work on like Titan, for example, and, and other hazes like that on uh, other gas giants as well. Um, and it has been used for different exoplanets um, in some of the work that uh, Peter has done in the past. Um, and so the, the, the real reason why it's driving this factor is, for example, in this case, is that this is the microphysics that we understand, for example, that we see in our own atmosphere and includes the more physically driven um, parameterization than, like, for example, an approximation that Eddie said is giving and it's very hand wavy kind of uh, cloud uh, formation kind of mechanism. Now, in terms of whether or not that drives in terms of better fitting the observations, I think that's where we're at in this case for these brown dwarfs when we have all these great uh, exquisite data from JWST now is to really say, okay, does, even though we included car models here in this case, all these different factors that we include in these processes, is that going to be the most driving factor and important factors that we include in these observations? Or for example, is it really just vertical mixing, for example, the, the strength of vertical mixing that we haven't really well constrained? Or maybe it's just um, circulatory dynamics, for example, um, and all these different things um, that we haven't considered, for example, for these, because these are all like 1D column models, 1D models that we have here. Um, and so I think this is a really exciting time where we're actually really going to learn what really is the, is the important factors uh, for these models. 
Yeah, and with such exquisite data as well. So yeah, I guess I'll, I'll stay tuned for the applications to WISE 0855. Yeah, very cool. All right, uh, David, I think you've got a question. I'm willing to seed my question if there's another question since I already asked one. I do not currently see one, so I think you can go ahead. Okay. Um, uh, James, a nice talk. Um, so I, I'm curious, what are the... What are your expectations on how the models change um, when there's an outside irradiation source, like a, an exoplanet would have from a star as opposed to an isolated object like a brown dwarf? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, with those increasing, if uh, you have like additional flux for the, up in the upper atmospheres, for example, coming to the atmospheres, and this actually might dissipate the clouds that are maybe further up in the atmospheres that you might see depending on the temperature of the objects or which layers the clouds are condensing. Um, because of that increased heating in those layers of the atmospheres, uh, it might move the, the thermal structure of the profile to actually warmer than that condensation curve, for example. And these water clouds might dissipate that you see, for example, even here on Earth, for example, when it gets warmer, you can see the dissipation of the clouds, for example, in some cases. Um, and that might really change um, the layers of where the clouds are condensing. Um, in the yeah. atmospheres for these irradiated objects. All right, thanks. All right, any additional questions for James? I guess I have one more. I, since you brought up the 3D effects, have you are you uh, planning on looking into that at all? Is that something you're interested in with regards to, I mean, I've done a little bit of this, but not, you know, in the brown dwarf context. So, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, are you, is that something you're looking forward to doing for brown dwarfs with, uh, with Picasso, I guess? Um, I think that'd or be Berger. really exciting and really great work to actually do is looking at the, the 3D structures of it. Um, it becomes, as you know, the complexities of doing 3D GCMs, for example, of these objects are become more and more complex. And, and how the interactions of, for example, clouds in each of these cases are going to be a lot more difficult because it's already really difficult to converge a model for these 1D um, thermal structures for these objects with like water clouds, for example, because it's high sensitivity um, to the thermal structure profiles. And so I think it'd be really interesting and something that I would love to be able to do um, in the future and something that uh, would be like a huge project on, on take that would be exciting to do in the future. All right, all right. Okay, uh, well, with that, uh, thanks again, James, and thanks again, uh, Daniel, for two excellent talks today. Give them a last round of applause.